this week we're going into emulation and about how to attack source code well not source code but how to attack binaries if you don't have access to the source code especially if it's on windows is a really good example or if it's another critical security process that you either don't have access to the source code you need to review or a component of it is is not one you have access to one thing i will say though is you can always fuzz binaries and things without access to the source code but having access to the source code and using instrumented fuzzing allows you to perform a real rigorous test on the software which is very, which is excellent to build up structure and important bits of data to get deeper and find those more sort of difficult books now if everyone moves to this notion of instrumented fuzzing and get getting really hard to discover bugs then it's going to take another technique beyond what people are applying now to go and find more bugs because fuzzing doesn't find all the bugs in it you know it never will it's not its purpose it's to find as many as possible and hopefully reinforce good design paradigms and good programming paradigms but all part of this is predicated on, or at least this week is all predicated on, understanding instruction set architectures, what things like Intel and ARM are. I wouldn't say what the difference are, we're not going to go into the actual specifics of them, but how you can actually run stuff within VMware or something like that, or VirtualBox, if you've ever done that previously. So the first thing I really dig into here is discussing emulation so we have emulation and my example i always use is oops if i'm a developer and with the developer i've got a windows laptop or a linux laptop whatever and my job is the type of developer i am is to write mobile applications for android so I want to write a mobile application on my Windows laptop, which will be running Intel, probably x64. But my mobile phone is going to be running something like ARM or IR64, which is essentially 64-bit ARM. So the problem I've got now is that processors can only run, or programs can only run Operating systems, shall I say, can only run programs on the processes that they're built to run on. So you have these compatibility issues. And where it begins is from this idea of Turing completeness and being or, or understanding that all processes are fundamentally the same. Now, you, you people, you may have heard people just, just talk about Turing completeness before, but we really sort of have to dig into what it means to sort of really understand this concept. So I may have explained this, but there are, th I would say, three general types of machine that exist. So the first one's called a finite state machine. If you really want to go into computability theory, I'll have to make another, another course, but this is what we're going to talk about. Finite state machines can solve some problems. If you've ever played... My God, I can't remember what it was called. If you ever, uh, there was a game where you used to like hack stuff, but as part of it, you used to like connect water pipes together. Now, what people really need to understand is that a computer isn't something that's electronic. It's something that can perform a set of operations sequentially that can solve some sort of problem. So when we just talk about computers or machines, we're very much thinking about them in an abstract sense of it's something that can solve a problem. Now, it turns out, with machines, there are three fundamental types. And this, like I said, doesn't have to be electronic. You can just imagine it, a bunch of water pipes connected in a really intricate way. But the sort of one at the centre we have is what's, what I would discuss as a finite state machine. This is the very basic. This is a ASIC or FPGA type thing, generally. And what these can do is, is they're like a state machine. I mean, by definition, they're a state machine. But if you've ever seen a state machine in any sort of protocol is they'll go from one step to the other and based on the actions of the last one they'll be able to perform a different action but at the center of it the core finite state machines are the sort of fundamental building blocks of computers now a superset of those sorry they, they are a subset 
of, I believe they're called linear pushdown machines, but I'll just say RE for regular expressions. So there are some problems that finite state machines can solve, but there are some problems they cannot. However, with regular expressions, and the, I'm talking about the ones that you have in your code, if you talk about the proper regular expressions, there are some problems that a regular expression computer or machine can solve that a finite state machine can't solve. But a regular expression machine can solve all of the problems a finite state machine can solve. But there are, it can also additionally solve some other problems. And then outside of this, we have another superset called a Turing machine. Now, a Turing machine is a fundamental, oh, sorry, it's a theoretical machine that exists that can then solve a different set of problems. And I know I'm speaking very abstractly, but this is sort of the idea. We have the first type of machine, finite state machines, and this can solve some amount of problems. There's well, I wouldn't say it's well-defined, but it's generally well-defined what we can and can't solve. Then we sort of, then we move out to linear pushdown machines. <laughs> And these can solve more problems than a finite state machine can, but they can't solve as many problems as a Turing machine can solve. Now, one of the things that Alan Turing asked was, is there another theoretical computer that can sit outside here? And the answer is no. The Turing machine is mathematically provable, the most complex machine that anyone can build, no matter how advanced you are within the realms of logic and physics within our universe at least in the rules, the way we understand them. Now, quantum computers also abide by these these rules. It's just that they can perform things in a very parallelized way and, and perform things very, like very, very quickly. But theoretically, a quantum computer can't perform any actions that a Turing machine can't perform. And I explained this last week, well, I explained this a few weeks ago, that some problems you just cannot you cannot solve and one of them is called the halting problem is it's there are some problems that you just can never tell if a program is supposed to stop and exit cleanly or it's supposed to stop without crashing or it's supposed to run forever there are some so for very trivial problems you can you can solve this you can actually look through the code and check however there's no general way to solve some set of problems beyond the, those encompassed by the Turing machine now, what's really interesting about this is we always discuss different machines and different processes to be Turing complete. So if I have this, the remember, it's a theoretical machine that can solve a bunch of problems. And then I build a physical machine. Let's just draw as a processor. And this processor can solve the same amount of problems that a Turing machine can. Then we say that this thing here is Turing complete. Is everyone okay with that? I really want to make sure people understand that because it's a bit of an abstract way of thinking. You said I think so. Okay, it's 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 one of my most favourite areas. I'll, actually, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll I'll just let's do it let's do a let's just do a finite state machine. Why don't we just build one? And it's gonna have two states. And we're gonna have a string. And when I say a string, I just mean a string of zeros and ones in any order. Now this machine that I'm going to build is going to tell me whether or not there are an even amount of ones or zeros. So I'm gonna say this machine is going to check if there's an even amount of ones or zeros. And we have some place that we start, and this is literally how you do, this is how you literally do finite state machines, is this is going to be my start point. If I'm here, I just need to make sure I do this properly, and I detect a one, if I read here and hit, read the first one here, I'm going to draw an arrow to the second state. And this is if a one, if a one has, if we've encountered a one. So I start in my start state, I look at the string, it's a one. So I go along this path into this node here. And the, remember, the job is to say, is there an even amount of ones? So if there's a zero detected, I stay in this state because there's still an even amount of ones. So if there's a zero detected 
However, if I detect another another one, then it makes it even. So I need to come back to this state. And this is this is so this is a finite state machine. Uh, so this would be zero, and this would be actually odd and even. This is a finite state machine. So the, by by state, that means there's a limited amount of states here, and it is a machine. So we can actually solve this. And we we feed this string to this program, and it's supposed to tell us whether or not this has an even amount of ones in it or an odd, odd amount of ones. Uh, actually, I think they got that the wrong way around, didn't I? Yeah, so that's odd and even. That's zero, odd and even. My bad. So we start off in the start state. I look at the first one. There's a one. So I follow the path. I'm now in this odd state. I read zero. There's a zero. We stay in the same state. I encounter a one next, so I move back to this even state because there's now two ones in the string. We've now detected two ones. So we detect at the next one. So I go to the right. I've detected a one. So we're now in an odd state because there's three ones. One, two, three. I encounter a zero. I stay in the same state because there's still one, two, three ones. And then finally, we have a one. We go into the even state. So I know, and this is, you can prove this, 100% of the time, if I read some string in, if there's an even amount of ones in that string and I follow this process, because this is a machine and the machine is just, is this process. It's not like the physical thing. If I follow this and I follow these set of rules, if I end up in this left hand column or where I saw this left hand node or where I started, then there is an even amount of ones in this string. If I added another one here, I would flip back and go to the end and it would always tell me whether or not 100% if there was an if there was an even amount of ones or an odd amount of ones in the string. Does everyone understand that? Because all you do is you look at it and you go, I start here. Remember start, I'll just put start, S for start. There's a one, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. This is a machine. This is what a finite state machine looks like. They can become more complex than this, but this is a really good example of something they can solve. Something they cannot solve, and this is also is 100% is possible, is does everyone know what a palindrome is? A palindrome is a word that if you write it, does anyone have an example that you write it forwards and backwards and it's the same? Race cars are palindrome. So if I read it from right to left, ace car, it is also the same backwards. R A C E C A R. If I go backwards, R A C E C A R. Race car and race car. That's what a palindrome is. Is everyone happy? This string here of ones and zeros is also a palindrome. It goes one zero one one zero one or one zero one one. Zero one. It's the same backwards and the same forwards. This finite state machine here, and no finite state machine, even though so even though it can perform some operations, it can tell me if if there's an even amount of ones or an odd amount of ones in the string. So that's solving one of the problems. It could never tell me. It's impossible for it to ever detect if it's a palindrome. It just cannot do it. Using this logic here, we cannot ever. We cannot ever figure out if this is a palindrome. And what I mean by that is that if you split it down the middle, it's the same on each side. It could just, it can never figure that out. Is everyone happy with that? There is, but a finite state machine can't do it. This is what I mean about problems. The first problem we wanted to solve is by just counting or just seeing if there's an even number of ones or an even number of zeros in the string. So that's one problem. And we, we designed a machine here to solve that problem. Now, the first types of machines are finite state machines. And this machine here and the way we've constructed it is a finite state machine. And it could tell us if there's a number of evens or amount of ones or zeros, or what, even or odd amount of ones. But it can't tell us if there's a palindrome, if it just cannot. Now, the next sort of machine that you have is a I guess they call them linear pushdown machines which is is essentially a finite state machine so every time I think finite state machine just imagine a model like this so it's a finite state machine of some kind 
and it has a bit of memory. It has one stack of memory, is, is a really good example. So this is a different type of machine. So this here, it doesn't have any memory. It just follows some actions, but it has no memory. If we give it a bit of memory, well, by a bit of memory here, what I mean is one stack, this can actually solve more problems than a finite state machine can. Now, I'm not going to go into the problems because they get very complex very fast, but this can now solve different problems. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah, literally, yeah, because I've given it memory. This didn't have any memory. It just performed an actions. It's like so if I told you... you to go to, if I told you to turn right at right 90 degrees um, four times, you'd end up facing the way you were again. You're just following some actions. You don't need memory to do it. You just follow rules. So that's what a finite state machine is. And like I said, so... there are some problems that a finite state machine can solve and some it can't. Yes, yeah, so there are some problems that you require memory to have. There, there just are some kind of problems because you can now do this as well, but also put stuff on the stack and take st well, put stuff on and take stuff off the stack. And this is unlocks another set of problems or another bunch type of problems for us to be able to solve. Is everyone okay with that one? However, the next question is is well, what happens if we give this more memory? Can we solve more problems? So this, we know we were limited to solving some problems. This here, and one of the things is, so this is one of the things that comes under here is regular expressions. But I know now that this, this type of machine here can solve more problems than a finite state machine. I should have really done that in green. Uh, just put push down machine. But there are certain things that this thing can solve that this thing can't. So these are two fundamentally mathematical provable different types of machines now the next question is if this can solve more problems if this push down machine here can solve more problems than a finite state machine is there another machine that if we give it some additional memory or we give it some additional capability is there does another machine exist to solve more problems is everyone okay with that question yeah so we we say is there a next generation <clears throat> machine if this had one stack of memory what happens if I give it two stacks of memory? Does that mean it can solve more problems? Are you okay. okay with that logic? Cool. So what we're going to do is we're going to have <laughs> this core idea of a finite state machine. And then what we did, remember, we, we added one stack. And then we added two stacks. Now, this isn't strictly how Alan Turing described it, but this is essentially what happened. So it turns out that having a finite state machine that we can reprogram and two stacks of memory is equivalent to a Turing machine in the way that Alan Turing described it. So this thing here, finite state machine, this can solve some set of, some amount of problems. And one of the problems, like I said, is checking if a string has an even amount of ones or an odd amount of ones. Then we gave this, this finite state machine or a finite state machine some memory, one stack of memory. And it was able to solve problems that a finite state machine couldn't. So we get to this point here. So then the next question is, is with this finite state machine and one stack of memory, can we give it another stack of memory here and then we can solve even more problems? And it turns out, yes, we can. If we give a finite state machine that we can reprogram two stacks of memory, it can solve more problems than a finite state machine can with one stack of memory, which can solve more problems than a finite state machine on its own. Is everyone okay with that? You just have to, I'm not going to go through the proofs. You just have to take my word for it. So here's the thing. If a finite state machine, a, a reprogrammable machine, shall I say, with two stacks of memory can solve more problems, what would be the next logical step to take okay so yeah that's a good thing right so we go if we have a finite state machine right that has two stacks what happens if a finite state machine with three stacks exists can that solve any more problems what does anyone think the answer is no there are no more problems to be solved this is the most complex type of machine that can ever exist 
and it's provable. You can you can like prove this. It, it, it's absolutely fascinating. And Alan Turing did this, and, and the theoretical machine he said it here, he called it a Turing machine. Well, actually, I don't know if he did it or someone else named after him. But this is a Turing machine. It's like it's like a reprogrammable machine with essentially two stacks of memory, and no nothing you can do to this will give it the ability to solve more types of problems. Nothing. We've even pushed this into the quantum world to say solve things in a very parallelized way, um, mm -hmm. using quantum entanglement. No, so there is, it's not. There's, it's not that there's not another finite state machine. There is no other configuration we can have, can have a machine in that can perform any more actions than this thing can. This Turing machine. This is it. This is the. Um, th remember, it's all theoretical. We're not talking about how complex or how much memory it has, but there is nothing else that uh, any type of. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the really fundamental thing. But I'm thinking about this in a really abstract way. I'm not describing that. I'm not describing the exact configuration of the of the of the computer. Finite state machine can be as complex as you want it. It doesn't matter how complex you make it, even if it's infinitely big, there are some yeah. problems that it can never solve. But this, that an infinitely complex finite state machine, if we if we set it here, it could be at any configuration, and we gave it one stack of memory, it can solve more problems than the finite state machine can so mm. the next logical conclusion as well you know if we have because it's because the fundamental problem is with stacks right is you need to be able to like swap stuff over and and that's the sort of fundamental flaw with it, it is that with one stack you can't swap where stuff goes because you either have to take it out or put it on top yes yeah, so it's a really yeah. fundamental sort of point to raise and then, and then the next thing is is, is, is like if we had an in, a potentially infinitely complex finite state machine here and we had this ability to reorder things, that can actually solve even more problems than it could if we couldn't reorder things. And I don't really want to use the term reorder, but it's it's a really good example. Yeah. So this, and then and then the next question is, is that is there anything another machine could do? Remember, because we can now reorder things and swap them between and we can actually process them. Is there anything else or another machine type of machine we could build that can solve more problems than a Turing machine? And it turns out there isn't. That is it. There are three... I would say fundamental general types of machines that exist and that mm. is it in the universe and in our mathematics and our logic from what we know at the moment that is it which i think is fascinating and there are some problems that a turing machine just it's impossible to solve which means there are some problems that exist in the world sorry in the universe that even a turing machine couldn't solve it doesn't matter how many quantum computers you use doesn't matter how big the machine gets it doesn't matter how much memory you have or how quick it can go it just can never solve those problems and the halting problem is a really good example of this and i won't describe it but that just isn't now some people like talk about quantum computers that oh if they could go for an infinite amount of time they could solve some of these problems but you're just like eh. um but I, it's a really fascinating a fascinating area but everyone understand that idea no, there is absolutely, it doesn't matter how much capacity you have, how long you run it for, how quick it can go. It doesn't matter. There are some things you cannot solve in this world, in this universe. Which I find is absolutely fascinating. When I first learned that, I was just like, wow. Because everyone thinks that these computers are like all amazing and, and everything. And, that you know, they just can't solve certain problems. But the, the really interesting thing about this is, is to ask... Well, if we have to pick one of these three things to build, if we can have this finite state machine, this, uh, I guess, linear pushdown machine, and this Turing machine, can we build, let's say, a processor or a computer? Is it physically possible to build a computer that can actually, that matches the capabilities of a Turing machine? So this is, this is our, this is what we want to achieve. So what we do is we build processors. And let's just do an Intel processor. So we have an Intel x86 64 processor. So this Intel processor here is essentially a Turing machine because all of the actions a Turing machine can solve and all the problems a Turing machine can solve, we've actually built one, essentially. We've, this is a physical one that exists and this can solve every problem a Turing machine can solve and it can't solve every problem that a Turing machine can solve. It's equivalent. So this thing is essentially equal to a Turing machine. Is everyone okay with that idea? And the idea of building a physical machine like this and so asking and proving it's equivalent to a Turing machine is called being Turing complete. 
what's a really interesting thing, and this is why why I really need to explain it for to talk about emulation, is if we have another processor, and say so this is an ARM processor, one that you find on your mobile phone, can an ARM processor like solve any solve problems that an Intel processor cannot, or are there problems an Intel processor can solve that an ARM processor can't solve? And remember, these are equivalent to a Turing machine. So this is, I'd like to just not have anyone have a guess. No one. That's the correct answer. If this process, this ARM processor here, is Turing complete, it can perform the same actions a Turing machine can, can perform. Remember this theoretical computer. And we have an Intel processor, and it can perform the same uh, operations that a Turing machine can solve. Then for all intensive purposes, there are no, these are no different in the problems they can solve. The only difference is, is how quick they can solve them because, you know, counting, like finding the, the square root of a number is a very difficult problem even for humans and we use more energy to do it. But adding two numbers together is much simpler and it takes less time. And it's the same for, for, for processors as well. It's the same for computers. There are some problems that will take longer and you can optimize, optimize certain processes for doing this, like crypto coprocessors for performing cryptographical operations they can solve them faster than other processors can but they can the other processors can still still solve those problems it just takes them longer to get there but theoretically they are essentially equivalent now the real and now the really interesting thing is to ask is that well if we have this idea of a Turing machine and, and you know these are essentially the same in the problems they can solve because an arm processor is Turing complete and so is an Intel processor is Turing complete with memory and these things can only solve the same problems as one another well what's the actual difference and it turns out there isn't any difference in terms of what they can solve but the difference is is how quick they solve them and how much energy they use to do it and ARM processors use less energy to solve the same problems an Intel processor can that's why they're used in your mobile phone because your mobile phone is a portable mobile battery powered thing and if you had a really high performance intel processor in there your battery wouldn't last nearly half as long so this is why we we optimize an arm processor or the instruction set for being able to solve problems in a very energy efficient way whereas intel processors tend to do it in a much faster but more resource intensive way now the, the sort of difference between them sort of decreases over time and it's really hard to tell in some circumstances but that's for people like intel and arm to fight it out but i, I always i always find that just like a really interesting thing so this idea that no matter what type of processor we build they can only ever solve the same problems as the other processors if 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 they are initially turing complete if they eat are equivalent of a turing machine uh, well, it can depend on everything, but if you had, I, I mean, that's that's entirely does, the difference between them. It, it's it's down to exactly how they were built. So mm -hmm. you could give an ARM processor more memory, and it would still probably be slower than an Intel processor. If you got like an equivalent sort of Intel processor and ARM processor, the Intel processor would still probably win in sort of speed. If you gave it the same amount of energy and you gave it the same amount of memory to use, it would still probably win. But uh, sort of, it, it's really hard to tell because the, the lines are being crossed all the time. But the, the point is, is that you have these ARM processors, these MIPS processors, these Intel processors, and they can still perform the same operations and actions the other ones can. It's, it's just how long it takes them. And the way, the way we program these things, if I draw a Intel processor on the left, uh, I'm doing green, and an ARM processor on the right. And Intel is they have a set of I guess codes you could call them to represent meaning so anyone it was a really good question so anyone ever looked at a processor upside down and it looks like a square and it's got these like pins sticking out of it and these are just pins that you can apply voltage yep. levels on or read voltage levels off and what you could do in, I guess, early days, not not so much now, is that if you apply voltages to, say, these three pins, it would represent 
some instruction or if you applied a voltage to these three pins and then another three pins run after it it would mean something to the processor and this is essentially we're sending bit patterns zeros and ones into the processor in some form and what it's doing is performing operations based on what bit patterns we give it And what, like a really good example is, is if we have an addition instruction. So we want to add two numbers together. So we know we send in this bit pattern for add into this processor. It says, ah, oh, they want me to add two numbers together. So it it performs the set first, it receives the instruction. It goes, I need to add two numbers together. We give it the first number, the number is two. It waits, we give it the second number. The second number is three. And it adds them together and it sends us the number 5. Because 3 add 2 is 5. And the bit pattern that represents this addition instruction here, or how we send it into the processor, is described in a table. But there's another bit. Let's say this, like I remember, this side here is the ARM processor. So let's say that this bit pattern 01011 represents... I want you to perform an addition. We send an instruction, we send this, this code to the processor, and the processor, because it's ARM, knows what that means. It knows that 01011 means I'm going to give you two numbers to add together. However, on the incel side of the house here, we send 10101 to the processor, but that also means addition. And we send a, a second number, which is 2, a third number which is three and then it it sums them together and produces five however just notice that even though we've performed the same actions in the same sense that these things are during complete is that the bit patterns are different because the bit patterns to the different processes mean different things and where these bit patterns are stored i wouldn't say they're stored they're not necessarily in a big list but based based on different bit patterns we send it and the language you can think of this as a language because this means something to this ARM processor, whereas this means something to the Intel processor. And the difference between these things and the language we use to describe them is what we call instruction set architectures or ISAs. So this here is the architecture it uses. And you can think of it as just a big list of bit patterns to instructions that tell it what to do. And one example is the addition. It knows if I had this bit pattern 101011 in this table, it would say, ah, oh, that's an addition instruction. Whereas on Intel, if we had a 10101, bit pattern 0101, it knows that that's an add instruction. And even though they do the same things as one another, the language that they're written in is different. Is everyone okay with that? So that's fundamentally, really, the only difference between instruction set architectures. If you ever hear MIPS or ARM or PowerPC or Spark or Intel or RISC-V, it's just describing the different languages, really, of what or what the bit patterns actually mean to the processor. And they're all different because they've been programmed in different ways. So that's the idea of instruction set architectures and things like ARM and Intel. ARM and Intel is just a really good example. But we have this fundamental problem, as I sort of alluded to at the beginning. If I'm a developer and I'm on my Intel laptop, remember, and I'm writing you know, I want to write an Android application for my mobile phone. This here is only going to understand ARM instructions. So it's it's going to understand this idea of 01011 ARM instructions. However, the binary that I'm writing or, or the processor I'm on understands the instruction 10101. And these are a different language. These are diff written in a different language, a different type. Now I've got this problem where I need to develop applications for this ARM processor on my mobile, but I'm running an Intel laptop. So if I run or if I create a binary for an ARM mobile phone, for, for example, I can't run it because I don't understand what that binary means. Is everyone okay with that? Cool. So this is where emulation comes in. And this is why I described this whole idea of Turing Complete. Wouldn't it be nice if some sort of translations, because like I said, these things mean the same thing. 
And we have interpreters, right? We have interpreters in the real world that can translate between Mandarin and English and French and Spanish. Someone sits in the middle and can translate between the language. Wouldn't it be nice if we could have something that could do the same in computers? And we do. And those things are, are essentially, I guess, called emulators. Now, the one I'm going to use is something called QMU for Quick Emulator. I wouldn't necessarily say that that's all they are, but this is one of the fundamental things they can do. So if I am on my laptop here and I write an ARM binary and I want to I want to say do debugging or testing and I want to run that ARM binary, then I can still run it on this Intel processor. All this QMU is going to do is it's going to take this code in here, 01011, it's going to take it into QMU and it's going to translate it. And after the translation, the bit pattern that's going to pop out is 10101 and the processor knows what to do with this it knows how to actually perform this action but the binary and the instructions we've read here have been translated is everyone okay with that that's what an emulator is going to do it's going to allow us to emulate the environment here of this arm environment on an intel processor and that's what it means to be an emulator is everyone okay with that logic that's what an emulator does if anyone's ever sort of understood or wanted to know um but I'm going to show you this actually working. So I think it's quite cool. Uh, let me just load this up. Obviously, I'm going to have to write an application because I've not written an application. Oh, I've got one. Uh, Shrew test. One, so, one th so you've also got this other problem, actually. If I just describe this first, you've got this other problem. That when you do anything on a computer you've got two problems the first one is i've got some source code dot c for instance and i want to turn that into a binary and if everyone remembers we do this with a compiler so we have some compiler in the middle the compilers we've been using are gcc and clang are the most common ones you're going to have for c on linux anyway but the language that this binary is written in that we've actually worked with so far has always been in x x86 64. this is this is what we've been doing for the last three weeks this every time we've written some code it's always been translated into an x86 64 binary so how do we then make a binary for an arm processor well we just get a different type of compiler and the same compilers apply so gcc and clang so we take the same C code, we push it through the compiler, and it generates a binary. And this binary is for ARM. So that's the first step, is how do we take that C source code file into a binary of the language we want to translate it into? I've translated the C code through a normal compiler into a binary for x86-64 systems. However, because I'm writing an application for Android, I also want to be able to write it for an ARM processor. So this is what we do. We translate the C source code into an ARM processor. And this is called cross-compiling. The idea is that I'm compiling this source code for a system that is not my own. It's, it's, it's I guess, a bit like, not cross-contamination, but we're like crossing the sort of logical boundary, if you know what I mean. This is the idea of cross-compiling. We're compiling it for a different system. And the way we do that is with a set of tools here. So the tools you can imagine, we have compilers, but we also have assemblers and linkers. And these are a set of tools built to work with x86-64 code. But also we need an assembler and a loader that are built to work with ARM tools. So if we want to build C code into x86-64, we need a set of tools here, such, such as the compiler, the assembler, the loader, that are able to understand x86-64 code and write binaries in that format. But at the same time, we also run the write binaries in ARM. So we have another GCC, Clang, Assembler and Loader, but they understand ARM. So now these set of tools here, whichever platform you're building for, this is called a tool chain, your chain of tools that you use. So if you want to go and write a ARM binary, you need to go and install your tool chain here for ARM, 
And then once you've done that, you can use the ARM compiler and the assembler and the loader from it to write these ARM binaries. So that's step one. However, the next step is once we've done that, we want to run the binary. So then we have an Intel processor, but it's an ARM binary. And remember, that's how we built it. We built it by going from, uh, where did I put it? We built it from going, using our ARM toolchain through the ARM compiler into an ARM binary. And we get out this ARM binary, and now we want to run it on our system. And the way we do that is with an emulator in the middle. We want to emulate the ARM environment. And I'm going to use QMU, stands for Quick Emulator. And we're going to run this ARM binary, translate it. And this gets translated to Intel code. Uh, is everyone happy with that? Cool. That's what an emulator does. That, that's basically its job. It does this translation. Now, it doesn't just do instruction translation. It needs to also translate system calls as well, because that's not the only thing in a binary. But I'll just give you a really good example, a quick example. This is one thing people should do. So, so normally, if anyone's seen me compiling anything, they'll see me type in GCC. And then I'll give it the uh, the binary, uh, sorry, the source code, and then I'll output the binary. And I was like, oh, excellent, GCC. However, this, in this circumstance, is only an alias for the GCC on my system. It actually, the fully qualified version of it, is x86-64, is it Linux, I believe, GNU, GCC. So this is the actual compiler. This GCC here, that you're seeing here, this here is just an alias, essentially, for this whole thing. And this is my tool chain. So x86-64, run a Linux system, and it uses the GNU. Um, on the, I believe this is the application binary interface. Now, if I hit tab, you're going to see a bunch of stuff. So we've got G++, we've got uh, assemblers, we've got readelf, strings, object copy, object dump, loaders. And this here is the x86-64 Linux GNU toolchain. These set of tools, as I described before, is our toolchain for, for our system. So I can also just use this. So we're going to build it in x86. I'm going to build it for test.c-o test. All I've done is I've just added this bit at the front. And this will also compile the binary. So I can have a look at the binary, look at test. It says, oh, it's an x86-64 binary. And I can run it. There we go. It doesn't do anything. I didn't tell it to do anything. It probably should. Uh, oh, that was from last week then. Just get it to do printf. And there we go. It's a Intel binary. The one thing I'm going to do just to make it more consistent is I'm going to use the QMU x86-64 version. And I'm going to run it under QMU. So we're running it under QMU, but don't worry about it. We're just running a 64-bit binary, x86-64, on an x86-64 system. So the question is, we've got an ARM tool chain as well. How do we build ARM binaries? Again, so we say it's ARM, it's for Linux, and it uses the GNU extended ABI. And if I hit tab again, you can see that much like the other one, we also have GCC, we have size, we have strings, we have strip, we have read elf, we have object copy, object dump, we have loaders, we have assemblers. So this here is the ARM tool chain. So that's what it means. The tool chain is the sort of set of tools that we have. But much like the other one, I'll just do this with static to make it a bit easier. I can also compile that binary, test.c, and we can build the test binary. However, the difference is now, not only is it not 64-bit, it's also on ARM. So if I run this again, is it you okay, Dennis? Go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so, so... So in the apt repository here, there is a set of default pre-compiled, uh, which shall I say, apt install toolchain. So I want to, let's say MIPS, 
Oh, uh, it's actually, I believe it's a GCC MIPS. So I can say, I want to build the Linux GNU MIPS version. So I'm going to install this. As you can see, it's installing. Uh, you're going to have to wait a while. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know it would take that long, but just give it a second. But after I install this, I'm going to have access to the MIPS tool chain, which is, again, it's a Turing complete instruction set architecture in the same way that an ARM processor or ARM instruction set is a Turing complete uh, processor in the same way that an Intel instruction set is a Turing complete processor. They can all perform the same tasks as each other. The only difference is how much energy they use and how quick they can do certain actions. And things like okay. MIPS and PowerPC are very much optimized for embedded stuff, especially networking stuff. Um, was it Oct Octave or there's a MIPS Octave or something that, that's made, made for like very high networking switch traffic? Octavium, I think it's called. Intel is built for back end servers, your laptop. ARM is built for low energy use mobile phones. But now I've got access to this MIPS toolchain. So if I type in MIPS, Linux GNU, and hit tab, again we have a MIPS based assembler, we have a MIPS based GCC. But the, but the thing is here, the problem is, is that this is only a what happens if I need a MIPS compiler, but it's not for Linux, it's for VxWorks because that's a different type of operating system? Well, this tool chain's not going to work. And we also have sub architectures. So there isn't just ARM. There is a huge amount of ARM processors that maybe have specialized instructions in it. So not only, so don't think that this covers all of the tool chains that we can have and we can just go get them from apt. We have to then compile them to our specific language and our specific process that we want to use and our specific operating system. And when you're passing those, I think it's called uh, triplets, those system triplets, when you like use dash M or whatever, and you, you pass in things like MIPS, Linux, GNU, you're compiling, you need to build a tool chain for that exact type of system you've got. So when you're doing embedded programming is a really good example because all the operating system is different because all of the codes, going, or sorry, the process is going to be different. You need to build a tool chain that's preferably precisely the one that that processor needs and that development environment and that operating system requires or good enough. So this is when you're specifying the parameters. This is what you're really doing. You're telling it precisely what system you want to operate on. Is that okay, Dennis? Do you understand? Trust me, I have seen, I have seen one line of a compile command. So like GCC test.c, this here, I've, I, you can measure it in megabytes. I'm talking about tens of thousands of characters long, tens of thousands of parameters. I've seen them that a lot of them are repeated and obviously, obviously they're automatically generated for, for sort of files, but because of stuff that I've worked on in the past, like, like I said, 5G base stations, 4G base stations, they need to be really precisely built for those exact systems to get the most performance out of it. And that's the big requirement is if you, if you're someone that has to have these systems that are running at incredible speeds and they need to be very efficient. You better be mm -hmm. sure that the, the processor you've built matches these exact requirements you have. And then you have a tool chain and a compiler for it. And the other thing that's really interesting is that because you not, not can you only special, not can you only build these, sorry, not buy these processors. If you're a big enough company, you can go and build your own processor for this specification or like a, a type so you can have a like arm as a processor that uses low energy but say you had an instruction that was taking too much time and you said oh sorry a operation that's taking too much time on an arm processor and you go and buy you go and license the arm uh, the arm instruction set and you start fabbing your own chips you'll f you can go in there and add these instructions to perform certain operations quicker and, and crypto coprocessors are really good if anyone's ever seen the i think it's called SS sse i think extensions for intel processors you have registers like this you'll have ymm xmm zmm so in intel if you want to because regist normal registers like rex are only 64 bits wide if you want to move a 128 bit value with an R in an rex register the problem is is that it's only 64 bit wide so you need to do two loads into this which means you need to use two instructions however the ymm processor is 128 bits long and then the other extension xmm is 256 bits long and zmm is 512 bits long and you also have floating point uh 
specialized areas of processors as well to perform those those types of things too and it, and it can get really 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 complicated very fast especially for efficiency and the people that design these tool chains the people that design these compilers are absolute experts when they say that you can get a phd in compiling and it's an entire area of computer science in itself it, it that's some of the most clever people you'll ever meet because they just have to understand like at a atomic bit level what it means to apply an instruction like this and how do i translate what i want to perform as a human being on a on a on a computer how do i translate that all the way down to a transistor logic gate level in in some sort of really in some sort of really fabricated fast way and and a lot of this sort of problem is really being highlighted in things like spectra and meltdown because we there is vulnerabilities in how we do that and and part of that is we have to sacrifice security sometimes for speed a really good example is the j malloc algorithm is that malloc and algorithm should really be random but if malloc and algorithms are fully random then that slows down our time to access them so if you need a heap allocator that's really quick having it randomly distribute itself so we have to look it up every time it's really slow and that's much like speculative execution being able to predict which branches or being able to pipeline stuff based on the branches that are likely to take is a really good technology to speed computers up. And it's introducing all these bugs because it gets so precise. Does that answer your question, Dennis? So it's like, and, and you're always <clears throat> playing this. It's, it, it's coming down now. And, and I don't blame chip manufacturers for facing these problems because people are demanding more speed. They're demanding more specialization. And it turns out that all of these security things actually do physically slow stuff down. And people are like, oh, they should make it secure and fast. And it's like, it's, at some point, there's a trade-off. You just have to accept it. And Jay Malik is one of my favorites because they just accepted it. They made it as secure as they could without compromising the speed and, and, and the requirement that they had. And, and it gets really complicated. So, but like I said, we had... Uh, we what, the, what did we build that binary in? We have this test binary. Okay, so if I run... QMU. I'm going to run this binary under x86-64. But this binary didn't run. And the reason this binary didn't run is because it's an ARM executable. And we can't run it on a x86-64 system. But we're on an x86-64 system. But what's really nice about QMU is it does that translation for us. So there's a QMU ARM. And we can run test again. And we've just run a ARM binary this ARM binary using an emulator on my Linux system running on a x86-64 processor. And this is what emulation is doing. Everyone happy with that? Cool. QMU is really nice because what it's doing under the hood is as it's doing this translation, Let's let's do add. Let's do um, add first. We have let's say we've got an add instruction. We have a subtract instruction. We have a move between registers instruction, and equivalently on the left hand side for Intel, we also have an add instruction. Remember the difference is just the bit patterns are different, and we just need to translate them one to one. And on the left hand side we have a subtraction instruction, and then we have a move instruction. A really fundamental difference between ARM and Intel is that ARM doesn't have dedicated, I guess, return or stack instructions in the same way that Intel does. So one example would be if we wanted to return from a function. So we do an add, we add two numbers together, subtract, we subtract two numbers. And remember, this is sequential. This, this just goes down. Both of these just go down. We start at the top and we go to the end until the processor stops running. So for this first one, QMU can translate the addition instructions between each other because they're the same. It can translate the subtraction instructions between each other because they're the same. It can translate the move instructions between each other, move between register instructions because they're the same. And when we come down to return, the problem is now is that even though an ARM processor or ARM instruction set is Turing complete and can do everything an Intel processor can do, there is no return in ARM in the same way there is an Intel. You have this idea where we have to move something into the link register and then we can branch to the link register. So the problem is now is that we have this return instruction 
that translates to two instructions on ARM. Is everyone okay with that? Not everything is a one-to-one -one translation. It can be a one to a N translation, a one to a multi translation. So this is one of the other the, the other issues that we have. Even though that this here, these two instructions do exactly the same thing as this return instruction would do, we can we can use a different amount of instructions to perform the same actions. That some of these will be slower doing some things. It takes you know an extra clock cycle or an extra couple of clock cycles to do the same thing as an ARM processor, as an Intel processor can. But an Intel processor in this example would be faster because it's just executing less code. And if clock speeds are all the same, it is what I really want to get at. The nice thing with QMU is as it's doing this and as it's, as it's translating blocks, so again, if you have the Intel on the left, you're going to get a lot of notes for this, I've just realised. Um, we have the ARM process from the right. And as we're doing this translation, we have QMU. What's happening here is ARM sends a block of code to translate. It sends a block of code with instructions to QMU. QMU needs to translate this block of block of instructions. So it translates them from ARM, this block of code, and it translates it to Intel. And this is how it works. And then it emits that block of code. So we start in ARM, sends a block of code to QMU, essentially. It does the translation here. So I just put T for translate, and then it comes back up to QMU, and then it emits that block of code for the Intel processor. And the Intel processor understands what that block of code means because of this translation has happened. The really nice thing about QMU is that the, the sort of subcomponent within QMU that's responsible for doing this translation is called the tiny code generator because it's, it's generating code for the other processor. One really nice thing about this is that there, there is, you can either hook into this here as it's doing this translation, or you can debug it. So QMU actually allows you to debug as these translations are happening. So you can actually read when these are going on. So the one thing I wanna do first here is, if you remember with read elf, I'm able to read the header file for test. So remember test is a binary, I'm reading the header file and the first place, the first bit of execution that happens in this binary is called the entry point address. Because if you remember, binaries are just blocks of code. Let's just draw it here. This is a block of code. And let's say this is the each one of these is a different instruction. And essentially a machine just wants to get to the end and finish its execution. So each one of these is a different instruction. So we start at the beginning of the binary and we want to move along the block and hopefully at some point we get to the end. But there are branch instructions in here. It can swap from one code block to the other code block or it can even go backwards. It can go from here and it can get into some loop. So these are all the different actions that this can take. We really want to start. The computer wants to start executing here and it's going to execute the first instruction. Once it's finished, it's going to go to the next one, then the next, then the next, then the next, then the next, next, next. Here, it can either choose to go forward or it will choose to be in a loop and it can stay in this loop forever if it's an infinite loop. Or it can choose to branch, which would actually be another loop in itself, or it could branch here and, you know, exit early. So this is what this is what they're doing. And, and this is what these blocks of code are doing is as we do this, we're sending into this TCG. And remember... This red bit here, the place that we start executing this binary is the entry point. It might not be exactly at the start of the binary. And in the header file, we can read the entry point address here. This is, this is one of my favorite things about QMU. Not, not many people know this. I'm going to run the QMU ARM binary. Remember, test is an ARM binary. And I've just executed it. It also has debugging symbols, so I can say dash, is it just D for debug, I remember, if I remember, hopefully. Yep, it is. Yep, cool. So I can pass specify D, and then I can say exec, and I just need to do this one thing to redirect the input. And we're going to execute this. So we've executed it, and what's happened is as we've gone through here and we've done this translation, I've told it to print out 
every address that it goes through in these blocks. So each time it goes for new blocks, I'm, I've said to it, print out that new block address. And remember, I copied the entry point address and I can actually search for it, which was this address here. And it turns out within the binary, remember this is all in ARM, we're all executing ARM binaries here. The first block, the address that we execute here is the entry point. And then the entry point block, after we finish executing that block, it goes to this block and then this block and then this block. And these are all the addresses of those blocks of code that we are actually executing on the processor. And if you remember when I talked about, we I talked about the idea of we have a program is that's a, a, let's say it's some sort of representative graph here. And this is I explained this in the first week, and we can go through different nodes, and you know we can go back and forth, or we can skip stuff and go down even further. Is that we start at the beginning at the entry point and then we go down between these blocks hopefully getting to the end staying in infinite loop whatever but at some point we're either going to crash and exit non not cleanly we're going to exit cleanly or we're going to be in an infinite loop these are the these are the general sort of three things you can do and what i said in, in afl the first week is that it adds a bit of code onto the entry point of these blocks here and then each time we hit one of these new blocks we could go through one two three four and then we can do code traces. Or we could go down the left, five, six. If we go down the left hand side, it's gone through one, five, and six. And each one of these things is a different code trace. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I encourage you to go back to the first week because I described all this. What's really nice about QMU is even though we didn't do the compilation, we didn't have access to the source code, we just ran a binary. Even though there's no instrumentation here, with QMU, we're actually able to follow these addresses down. So this is the same thing. So this is like block number one, two, three, four. And based on what we feed to this, this binary, it will perform a different action. It will, it will go through and it will change what it's actually doing. It will change the blocks it's going through. And if we can do that, this is the actual instrumentation. We can just, trans, we can just trace which blocks it's going through, even though we don't have access to the source code. And this is what it is. This is what QM is really good at. Is everyone okay with that? And remember, the, the other symbols here. So this was start, and I said as well, uh, was it last week or two weeks ago, that here's libc start main. And essentially, at some point, after you've gone to the loader, we should see main. So I just look for main. Oh, not a bad idea, because there's two. This goes into libc start main a lot. Wow, an awful lot. Am I going back on myself? To a ah, there we go. So finally, we've hit main, and this is our main binary. And based on whatever we've given it in the code, this is going to go through a different set of addresses and a different blocks, and we're able to translate this all the way through the process. And this here, we didn't compile it with instrumentation. This is just a a a, a bit of code, a binary. We don't have any access to the source code. Is everyone happy with that? Ah, yes, a really good question. There is a inbuilt GDB server within QMU. And if anyone's interested, this is fascinating. I'm just going to go for a tangent. So you can actually specify, if you want to translate stuff in ARM, um, I, I don't know if I went into this a, a couple of weeks ago. I may, I think I did actually with you. Um, you can run this binary within QMU. I, I can't remember if it's G just listens on 888. I'll have to really remember. I can't remember the exact format because it's different. And I run this binary. Is it this one? Uh, you know, you can actually even go in between them. You don't just, because those things there were just the, the blocks you're going through. Uh, you can actually apply breakpoints to the individual instructions. Uh, let me just remember. I can't remember. I can never remember the actual format. It's like GDB uh, QMU. And this is what I did a lot when I wanted to attack. If I wanted to fuzz and attack binaries that I didn't have access to the system to, but I could get hold of the binaries, but they were written in a different language, I could actually still attack them. And this is this is one of the things I did. So, oh, now you're testing my, on my brain. I was doing this the other week as well. I just completely forgot. Um, let me remember the exact command. Is it dash S? No, so that's the system one, isn't it? I thought it was dash G. You can do it. I'm sure I showed you. I showed you the other week to, that you can do this. I'm sure it was. Arm test. So we run that. 
and then dash G8080. Now there we go. So it's now it's now frozen in a loop. So I can uh, just come here and I'm going to use GDB multi arch. I'm going to load the test binary up. We found those test binaries. Now I'm going to target. I can now remotely connect to it. Remote, I believe it was 8080. Can I use that and now? We're actually within the binary, and this is ARM instructions. And what I said before about the uh, the branching is we don't have return instructions within ARM. We have we have BL for branch link registers. So now we're ex actually executing ARM code. This is libc start main. I can step into it. Actually, if I just put break on main and continue, we're now in main. And I can execute this. And this is all ARM instructions. That's how you do it. So we've actually run qmu we've specified dash g for saying we want to run a gdb server we've said the port we want to connect to it on and then within gbdb we've done target remote because it's a remote server 8080 and we've connected to it i also used file to load up the binary so i know it was test to get to grab all the symbols but yeah so we're actually running we're emulating a arm binary on an intel x86 processor and we've also spawned a GDB server that we're able to go through and debug it. So you can, and, and the really nice thing about this, and, and like I said, we can also do the code tracing, as I said previously. So I just need to continue this to the end, and it will exit. God, uh, cool. Now it's ended. So we're not going to connect to a GDB server either. But like I said, you can do it with ARM, and, and, and like I said, we also did that tracing. So we did that really nice tracing dash d i'll get rid of this and we can run it and it and it does all that nice tracing and these are the as the translate the translation blocks are being executed and they're being understood eventually it gets to exit and then quits but the really nice thing is that this is actually what's generally in a code trace this is what it's doing each new block we're hitting we're seeing these instructions and looking up if we've generated a new code path and that's what we're doing and then someone had the very good idea that you can actually combine this with fuzzing because we can tran we can actually trace the files, right? So what else do we need? We need a way to pass data to it. So we need a way to pass data to we need a way to pass data to the binary. So we have some binary. Could be Windows as well. We don't have access to the source code. So we've got some binary here. And we can either give it a file, for instance, or we can give it this standard input. But this is either an ARM binary or an x86-64 binary that we don't have access to the source code to. So it doesn't really matter. QMU doesn't give a shit. It doesn't care. But we have AFL down here. Whereas before with AFL, we would actually compile it. And it's the same thing. So we take this binary. And we take, actually, we have an input directory. So we have an input directory here. And we load... A test case from the input directory the first test case we also load the binary into afl but this time we run the binary under qmu qmu and we're running it in this binary here remember qmu can do tracing normally what happens is they patch in additional code in qmu because doing it this way is a bit slow so they actually give it additional functionality but what's going to happen is we're now running this qmu binary we load an input file, we send it through the mutation engine, you know, bit flipping, byte flipping, whatever. And then we send it to QMU. It runs the binary. It will be slower because it's doing it all in software, but it will do a trace. Now, QMU can also detect if stuff crashes, which is really nice. But essentially, we then give it to the output directory. And this output directory does all of that nice trace files, it does the crashing, it records all of that nice stuff for you. The only difference here is everything else is the same, but because we don't have an access to the source code, we've not been able to instrument it. It's always better to instrument it, it's faster. But even if we don't have access to the source code, we can still run the binary. Because we're using it through QMU, and QMU does all the nice tracing for us. So everyone happy with that? Oh, it is powerful. I have attacked real life systems running country this stuff and have found but it's not even in ARM binary. It's not even sorry, it's not even Intel binaries, you're talking about MIPS binaries. 
other stuff like and this is this is like when you get to the real negro this stuff is is hard it's not easy it's hard but the idea is, is that you can do it so this is what i say to people if you're a developer and you're not giving me source code or you're not at least um doing this yourself internally you yeah. can sure as shit but i'm gonna do it frida frida's a tool i used to do that regularly you've seen me use frida before because what frida's doing is it's the yeah. same injection thing it's detecting when Android binary is going to make a call to do a uh, called certificate pinning check, and just tell it or just ignore it. Just you can bypass certificate pinning. You can bypass anything you want. If I've I've gone above and beyond this quite a far way to myself. So this is all about mm. emulating just the binary. But just because you run a binary yeah. doesn't yeah. mean you have access to the source code. It doesn't mean you have access to the state. Yeah. So I went one further with a personal project and experiment of mine, and it worked. Is that a really good example if i just do this and anyone that i talk to this project around i will actually direct them to this talk so i'm not i get fed up with describing it but let's say i, I had some embedded server i'm just going to pick yeah. a 5g base station I'm not saying that i did this on a 5g base station but use your brain and this had some binary running on it that would read people's 5g messages or whatever and it would process them somehow so what my thing would do is if you, you put a, a GDB server, much like I showed you with QMU, what it would do is you would say there's some function, there's some function in this binary I want to attack. And let's say this function is here. This function is here. I want to attack that function. Now, the problem is with a lot of embedded systems is that they're not just programs on themselves. There's tens of thousands and there's loads of other stuff. There's tens of thousands of processors. There's loads of stuff in memory. There's access to hardware. There's loads of different things. So even if I did take this binary off and I wanted to fuzz it and I wanted to attack it using this QMU stuff that I was showing you, it's, it's not that easy. I also need all of this other stuff in memory and all of this state. So one of the things I did is I attached this GDB little hook down here and i did it in two ways so i attached this little gdb hook and when it hit a certain breakpoint or a certain function i was interested in fuzzing it would work in two ways it would download not just the process but all of the process memory including anything from the operating system i could get over network and yeah. it would send it to me on my computer okay. and then on my computer what i can do is using qmu is i can now fuzz that function Oops. If I have to interact with hardware, I can't do anything or the kernel. But I obviously respawn it within QMU on here, wrap it in QMU, that little function. And I can now just fuzz this function over and over and over again using QMU. The other really good thing is as well, is that if this thing here ever intercepted a message, I could get it to stop, send me the message. Let's say it was a DNS request, someone made a DNS request. I'd modify the message and then send it back. But not only that... Because I'm doing this QMU emulation, I can also trace it as it's executed within the within the machine, whatever it is. So okay. use it like that as well. And not only just that, you can do really cool instrumentation stuff. You can do tracing. Mm. You can do symbolic execution like this. There's a really cool tool by, uh, it's called Manticore, by Trail of Bits, that, that does all of this, but without access to the source code, which is really cool. You can reason yeah. about stuff. It's fascinating things, but it's, it's far, far beyond the... the it's too advanced for this uh, this lesson but these are the really cool types of things you're going to do but how about i just show you why don't we just attack a binary right yeah. using this type of thing so i'm going to use uh what's it called i'm going to use duct tape um just pretend i don't have access to the source code what i'm going to do so i may have already done it as i'm going to come in here and i'm just going to change the compiler so whereas before we used afl clang fast to add the instrumentation at source code this time i'm not going to i'm just going to compile it as it should be compiled normally so make file.cmd line i'm going to compile it remember there's no afl stuff popping up here every time i've done it previously it's used afl this time it didn't so what i'm going to do so remember, I've still got my input and my output directories for AFL here. I can type AFL fuzz, input directory, in, output directory, out. And I'm going to give it duct tape. I'm going to get two problems. I'll fix this first one because I never fix it. Remember, this is just the core patent kernel thing for dump, dump files. So let me just fix this quickly. This is unrelated to um, doing the fuzzing. 
Let's fix that. However, now I'm going to run the same thing. Remember, AFL fuzz, input directory, output directory, and we're going to attack duct tape. Aha. However, because we never built the binary with instrumentation, it says no instrumentation detected. Now, we can force it to do a dumb fuzz. We can actually say, just go away and do a dumb fuzz. And I've actually not done that before. Come on, come on with this. It's a D. And when we say a dumb fuzz, it just sends data to it, but it doesn't, re it doesn't detect uh, code blocks. And I can just specify dash D to it. Oh, actually, no, I can't with instrumentation. How long is that? But you can actually just attack the binary, but not have not use any of the instrumentation. You can say, sod it, I don't want you to look at the instrumentation, just run the thing. Um, but the, the difference is now, <laughs> and this is all it takes in AFL, this is why AFL is really powerful. I can just say use QMU instead, using dash Q. Even though we don't have access to the source code, theoretically, we haven't compiled an instrumentation. I can say, just use QMU. Let me just zoom out a bit. And I can run it under QMU. And it works. Now, if you remember... Uh, when we first did this, we'd get execution speeds of up to a thousand times per second. So we last week when we did this, we were getting two hundred executions per second. Uh, sorry, a thousand executions per second. Now we're only getting one hundred and sixty. However, we actually are finding code paths, even though we don't have access to the source code. We didn't instrument it. So if I get a binary that someone wants to attack that I don't have the source code for, if it's on something like Windows, I can still do this. And you can use things like Hong Fuzz to do this. There's loads of fuzzes. And I can still do this instrumentation. And we've actually generated a file that causes a crash. So the next question is, even though we're running this, and it's under QMU, because we never instrumented it, and remember, it's not just about being built with Intel on an Intel board. I can then go and build, let's say, build this on ARM. I'm not going to do it now, because it'll take, take, take too much time. I can go build QMU use the QMU version of ARM and I can then go and build the uh, and then I can run the fuzz for an ARM binary that I don't have any source code for that say runs on an Android phone I don't have access to the source code I can run it under AFL under QMU and still do instrumented fuzzing it'll be slower it won't be as fast but you can still do instrumented fuzzing so we found one crash file here this is the crash file that was detected uh, let's have a look uh, oh god, uh, it was an out crashes. That was it. Had this weird data in it. So we've read it in, so we can read this in, and then I can pass it to duct tape. And as you can see, segmentation fault. And remember, this can be on ARM. We can have compiled this on ARM as well, but essentially we don't have access to the source code, and we just use QMU to, as it did that translation bit in the middle. Every time it hit one of those translation box, we translated it and found a bug and this is a real life bug and and like i said before is if this is an arm binary and we go oh actually there's, there's a segmentation fault you can use that that uh, qmu tracing and you can use things like ida lighthouse i wrote a plugin that's able to highlight the blocks the differences between the fuzz cr last fuzz test that didn't crash it and the one that did and you can find the differences to find exactly where in the code the bug is or you can run it under gdb can i just run this under gdb um, so look. Oh, actually, can I do that? Uh, God, I can't write. How do you pass standard input stuff to GDB? Can I run this and then see it crash out? Crashes. Ah, so there we go. We actually found the segmentation fault. So I've loaded this crash file into GDB, and it turns out that it's in this bit of code at duck load funk at offset one uh, two four eight for some reason uh, we can actually go back in and have a look at why it crashed it crashed at this exact point it oh god i hate this let me let me change the flavor to intel uh was rakes cool so when we dereferenced something here we dereferenced uh, R15 add RAX times by four and then added 0x1c to it. I'm going to guess if I type in for reg that one of these is invalid memory. So RSI and it was R15, wasn't it? So it turns out that this is not valid code here for whatever reason. Whatever this referenced here isn't valid code. It couldn't read it and then crashed. So we know that there's some sort of dereferencing error 
Even though we don't have access to any of the source code, remember that. We've done this all without source code. We've been able to fuzz it, find a crash, prove that it's a crash, go in and debug it, and we can start working the problem and doing the analysis and the triaging to see where the problem was. And that's the really powerful thing about this. And we can do it without AFL. Oh, sorry, we can do it without access to the source code. We can do it for Windows binaries on Linux as well. We can do it without um, on, on different architectures, ARM, MIPS, RISC V, PowerPC, Arch64, whatever. That is fundamentals of emulated based fuzzing. Now, I'll try one way that I really like to use it, um, just really quickly. I'm not going to do an example because it just take too long. But if you want to go and attack a binary, just one binary, let's say, and this I don't have access to the source code or it's for ARM or something, I'm going to I'm going to need this to always automatically read. It's always going to have to automatically read. Um, a file or standard input and if this isn't built for this I'm not going to be able to fuzz it in the same way but what's really cool about this is I can also and you can cross compile this as well you can do it this way is if there is some if there is some library let's say DLL DLL or some shared object some shared object I want to attack and there is a specific function in here remember I don't have access to this DLL uh, the source code for this DLL, or I don't have access to the source code, or it's compiled for a different architecture, you know, maybe not so with the DLL. What I can do is I can write a program here that will read a file, or it will read a shit, it will read standard input, and it will call the function within here. We will call that function and pass that data in there. So this is just some function, or it will call this function and pass some data in here. And remember, I don't have access to these source codes or it's using ARM. So what I can do is, let's just say it's ARM, is I can actually cross-compile. This is my test harness on the right. So my test, let's put H, test for harness, AR. So this is my test harness on the right. I can compile this for ARM as well. And the really cool thing is now, is that because I've got this test harness and I read a standard input rate of file, I can send data within these libraries to actually test and fuzz these libraries. So if you go and get some Windows library, maybe that people don't use, or, or it's a library for some program that people don't want you to have access to, or even things like an IOCTL call, if you want to actually fuzz a bit of firmware, if you want to go fuzz a device and fuzz some firmware and you want to fuzz something, um, you can do something like this. I mean, obviously for the IOCTL calls, you can't do the instrumentation, but in this sense, we can run this whole thing under QMU and we can do this nice tracing and we can do this nice fuzzing. We can fuzz this even though we don't have access to the source code or it's on a different architecture, which I think is really cool. You can, and this works and it finds bugs and, and I've, I've found bugs in it. And like I said, if you're, if you're not fuzzing your code, I'm going to fuzz it for you. Then I'm going to charge you money for like the bug, right? Yep. How do you find I mean, function you want to attack? Typically what I do is I look for anything that's doing big parsing stuff. So if 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 there's if in someone if someone has written a DLL for something and let's say it's a web server right someone's written a custom web server just do HTTP for the web server and they've written a library a DLL library now part of this web server is to it has a RESTful interface or it uses SOAP so you send uh, REST REST requests to it. And it has a JSON parsing functionality. So I might not care about the front end. It might just be a main function. But part of this in this library here, there might be a JSON parser. And they don't give me access to the source code. I could then just go and build my own uh, binary here. And I could just call that JSON parser within this DLL. So what I'm doing is I'm looking for anything that's going to be reading a lot of data and trying to make sense of it. It's going to try and parse it. I'll call that in here and, and run this whole thing under QMU and fuzz it. And what I'm doing now, so I'm fuzzing this JSON parser from this DLL file, even though I don't have access to the source code using this. And it's just gonna read files in and it's gonna pass that data to that JSON parser and then be able to fuzz it that way. And, and, and that's largely a manual process. You're not gonna automate that. You're just gonna to have to look for specific functions you're interested in and go through and attack it, but it works. So you don't need access to the source code. You don't have to disassemble it. So this will have this this DLL will actually export it. This will say this is one of my on my export address tables. It'll say you can use this. So if I have a look at a shared object on my Linux box here, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Let's have a look at LDD, uh, uh, Duck, wasn't it? No, it's not a dynamic issue, it's been statically linked, didn't know that. So let's just do LDD uh, slash bin slash ls, that's an easy one. Uh, we're going to look at libpcre, so this is going to be a regular expression library. This is its fully quantified thing, just make sure that's not redirect. Symbolic mm -hmm. link. Uh, So it's actually that zero nine two eight zero point nine dot zero. So there's the actual library. So this is the library. This is essentially like a DLL. It's a shared object with an SO name. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read this. So I'm just going to read elf and I'm going to say, tell me everything you export. I'm going to read all the symbols. And it's going to tell me all the symbols it exports. So Oh, God, we've gone too far. So some of these here, um, I just want to see if there's a really easy to understand one. Piece of e, I don't know, compile this, it get match data size, right? These are functions that it's exporting. So I can say, if I don't have access to the source, the, the source code, and I want to attack this match binary, I just need to include this. As, as long as I know how data is passed to this, and this is the point where some reverse engineering might be required because you might not know what the function signature looks like because you don't have access to the source code. But if you do some reverse engineering, watch how it works, you can figure it out. And then all I need to do is write my own binary that calls this function. And when I do the match, I just say, well, AFL, read from a file, and whatever's in that file, pass it to that function, fuzz under QMU, and we can do that really nice um, instrumented fuzzing stuff cool so that's basically all of the stuff i wanted to go through for the week and it's been nice teaching you guys for four weeks now um i hope you've learned stuff i hope you can go away and attack stuff what's really nice is that i know next week that the, the course i'm taking next week is one of the guys from there has actually started fuzzing stuff based on some of the early videos i've released and he's found some proper zero days so I'm hoping that um, after they've all been fixed, I can give the example code to people and then they can go out and uh, start attacking it as well. And you can see this was actually a proper uh, zero day thing that someone found um, doing these courses and, and you know, hopefully teach people. But, you know, I encourage people to go out and do this. It, it just find stuff, attack it because you will find bugs. I guarantee you'll find zero days. You'll be able to claim CVs. And this is this is how it works. And it's it's been cool teaching you guys.